Welcome, everyone. Good day. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of Boston University's Global Development Policy Center, or the GDP Center, as we like to call ourselves. Our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and the environment across the world. And one of our signature initiatives is called the Global Economic Governance Initiative. It looks at the trading system, international monetary system, and beyond. Today, we're going to talk about the EU Mercosur Free Trade Agreement, something that started way back in the 1990s uh, and has now reached a consensus in terms of the, the text uh, among the different parties. However, it's still yet to be signed and still a far way off from being uh, ratified. It would represent the largest trade deal for both Mercosur countries in the southern cone of Latin America and the, and the European Union uh, for both blocks in terms of the number of citizens involved. While previous studies have made projections for the free trade area's impacts, none have considered the impacts on employment, wage inequality, and productivity growth among the bloc's economies uh, and how they might affect the outcomes. And that's what Yeti Capaldo, Yedinim Capaldo and Azal Momer have done in a new working paper from BU's Global Development Policy Center. Uh, it looks at the prospects of the FTA in Argentina, Brazil, Germany, Italy, France, Turkey, the Czech Republic, and Poland. And our researchers conclude that the agreement is likely to be a step towards less productive, more unequal, and more vulnerable economies, not just in the Mercosur countries, but also in the European Union. According to the research, all of the countries in the studies have recently experienced economic polarization, making them more vulnerable to the risks of trade liberalization of this particular kind. Additionally, existing projections already uh, point to small GDP gains from the EU Mercosur deal, while polarization and other adverse outcomes are likely to push most of the countries surveyed, especially in Mercosur, further away from a sustainable growth and development. Joining us today to discuss the results of this paper are the co-authors Yedinim Capaldo and Aslam Omer. Yedinim Capaldo is a non-resident sc senior scholar here at the Global Development Policy Center. He re researches globalization, trade, and labor market policies, and he's an expert on global macroeconomic models. He's currently an economic affairs officer in the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies at UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, where he contributes to the annual trade and development report. He has a MA from the University of Rome and a PhD in economics from the New School for Social Research. His co-author is Azam Omer, who's a postdoctoral fellow here at the GDP Center. And her research includes growth and inequality, the distributive impacts of economic policies, forces and dynamics of structural change, and financial crises among others. She was an assistant professor at NAVU in Turkey and holds a master's degree in economic policy from the University of Illinois and a PhD in economics also from the New School for Social Research. Additionally, we're gonna be joined today by three experts from the EU and Mercosur blocks to provide their pers perspectives and reactions on the study and beyond. We'll have Nelson Barbosa, a uh, professor at the Gatilio Vargas Foundation at the University of Brasilia. His research interests in include macroeconomic policy, economic growth and development. Dr. Barbosa, uh, has served in various capacities of the Brazilian Ministry of Finance, including Deputy Finance Minister, Finance Minister and Planning uh, during the Dilma Rousseff administration and as Secretary of Economic Policy and Monitoring uh, during the Lula administration. He's also worked at the Brazilian Central Bank and has a PhD in economics from the New School for Social Research. Ramiro Bertoni is a professor and researcher at the National Universities of Quilmes and San Martin in Argentina. He's the former president of the Argentine National Commission on Foreign Trade, and he also previously provided technical support for Mercosur negotiations, including the common external tariff of Mercosur and an external zone negotiations on bilateral trade defense issues and those regulated by the WTO up until about 2017. He's also participated in other bilateral, regional, and multilateral negotiations and has a PhD from economics uh, from Buenos Aires National University. We'll also be accompanied by Nadia Garbellini. She's the principal investigator of an Institute for New Economic Thinking grant for international trade theory in a globalized world, a reconsideration. Her research applies a standard input output and graphic theoretical techniques to the problems of the measurement of productivity changes, income distribution, and international trade. 
She's previously held postdoc positions at the University of Pavia and was an adjunct lecturer at the University of Milano Bacocca. She has a MA in economics from the University of Pavia and a PhD in economics from the University of Milano Bacocca. This webinar will be simultaneously translated. So if uh, in some of the, most of the presentations will be English, but at least one will be in Spanish. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your uh, Zoom screen here, you'll see an interpretation button. So click on that and choose the language that you'd like to uh, speak in or, or, or listen to. Uh, also right next to that, you'll see a Q&A button. So after our presenters uh, discuss, uh, uh, Yenanim Capaldo will speak for about four minutes and, and then, um, and then Oslo Momer after, and then there's the comments by our guests. After that, we wanna engage with all of you on a, in a global conversation about all of these issues. Please put your name and your affiliation so we can all get to know each other and your question in the Q&A box. And after we go through the presentations, I'll field some of those questions back to all the speakers so we can have a global conversation. So without further ado, let me pass it over to Yedinim Capaldo uh, and congratulations all on this wonderful study and for our friends for uh, coming to give some commentary on it. Yeti. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. Okay. So this agreement proposes to cut tariffs and non-tariff measures uh, uh, for a wide uh, range of products to enforce the stronger rules, including on intellectual property and to promote sustainable development uh, by supporting workers' rights. The, the key quantitative um, information we have on this has to do with tariffs. And as you can see from the tables, the tariffs are supposed to be cut on the vast majority of imports into both the EU and, and Mercosur. To understand how this is likely to impact the economies involved, it's good to review the possible benefits and losses that we can expect um, from trade liberalization. And very briefly uh, and summarily, the, the critical benefits that we can expect have to do with the potential to expand aggregate demand, which might lead to economies of scale, a better division of labor and stronger innovation, to provide uh, more foreign exchange, which is critical, and overall to in, um, um, uh, engender positive structural change, uh, provided that the sectors that expands are, the expand are those uh, with positive impact on domestic demand. On the other hand, the risks have to do with the uh, specialization in potentially low productivity and low wage sectors, higher inequality, the possibility of adverse structural change and of deindustrialization as many countries have experienced, and overall the possibility to accelerate that global race to the bottom towards cheaper and cheaper products and cheaper labor uh, costs um, that might weaken aggregate demand and ultimately uh, trade volumes themselves. So where does that leave us for the EU and Mercosur? According to uh, existing projections and the most cited projections, the uh, uh, expected impacts are very small, almost negligible, uh, less than 1% of GDP after 15 years as a one-time boost uh, for all economies involved. But uh, unfortunately, these benefits on top of being very small also rely on several unrealistic assumptions, including full employment, the constant income distribution, so, so inequality will not uh, uh, deteriorate, fixed productivity, and the assumption that the economic polarization that most countries have experienced in the last few decades has not happened. Now, this obviously amounts to assuming away the, the most serious problems that these countries are contending with. But uh, on the other hand, in, in our analysis, the scenario is quite different. We, we see as the most likely outcome more income and employment polarization in most countries, uh, leading to inequality and more deindustrialization, overall pushing most countries away from sustainable growth and development. Now, uh, what we've done is uh, foregoing uh, uh, the idea of doing our own projections and in fact, focusing on those facts that the projections have entirely overlooked. And the first one of these and the most important one is a key trend that emerges from the data that, uh, signals how employment in dynamic sectors, that's the sectors with, uh, that achieve high productivity and pay higher salaries, employment in those sectors has been shrinking compared to uh, employment in stagnant sectors with low productivity and, and, um, and low wages. As a result, a, a growing share of value added has been produced and paid to a smaller share of people. As a result, 
polarization in the labor market has, re- has led to inequality and economic stagnation overall. This has had many causes, not just trade, but trade liberalization has certainly been one of them, especially the, one, the type of trade liberalization that's been enforced through agreements that are biased in the sense of uh, uh, seeking to, uh, to capitalize on the static comparative advantage that countries have. And unfortunately, the EU-Mercosur agreement in the current text is exactly uh, that, that type of agreement. So without commitments on macroeconomic and industrial policy that might uh, sustain domestic demand appropriately and improve distribution, it'd be foolish to, ex- to expect any different outcomes um, from this agreement that, that, that were experienced from after past uh, experiences of liberalization. And the general conclusion for us is the, the so-called evidence that is cited to support this agreement is in fact no evidence at all. Thank you. Awesome. Second, I'm sharing my screen now. Um, can you also see me? I hope you're seeing me. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I will try to give more details about the differences, structural differences between the two regions. Um, when we look at the data, uh, what we observe is negative trends on both GDP per capita growth rates and productivity growth rates in all the countries that we analyze. And when we dig into more data to see which sectors are actually contributing to productivity, employment, and profit share increases, uh, we realize that, as Yeri already mentioned, the stagnant side of the economy has been growing, which means most of the jobs that were created in all those regions were created in the uh, low productivity growth, low wage growth sectors. But this pattern, even though they were everywhere, it was even uh, more severe in Argentina and Brazil. As you can see, between 2000 and 2014, it was like around 7% uh, jump in those two countries. Uh, this uh, polarization uh, is basically the main cause of those um, uh, negative trends that we observe in the data, pure data. And when we look at the economies, they all have this dual economy working in reverse, like in the US, also in Germany and others. In this picture, we are looking at wage growth rate versus productivity growth rate, which tells us the story how these two distinct groups are aligned. Especially in Germany, uh, the wages were lagging behind productivity growth rates, especially in the stagnant sectors. That's why inequality has been increasing between those periods. The same patterns with different characteristics also happen in Brazil and the others, but we can discuss about the details later. Another important findings that we come across was actually the manufacturing sector role. It has been mentioned long ago and all, all, all the places, but we see that manufacturing sector's productivity, productivity is the main source of overall productivity growth in all the regions, all the countries. But when we look at the manufacturing sector in all those countries, we see that Brazil and Argentina, which are prematurely industrialized, has been they, the manufacturing sector's productivity growth, growth rate was the lowest, and their share in employment and value that has been also declining or lower than the others. So these patterns what was actually telling us the story that the, that was in the data for so long. And unfortunately, FTA, EU Merck's FTA provides no tools to reverse those, those uh, patterns. So for Mercosur, for sure, unless necessary macroeconomic policies are implemented within the countries, they will become more vulnerable. Of course, primary commodities production ex- and export will increase because of the setup in the, in the deal. Uh, and productivity might increase as a result in agriculture and mining, but unfortunately, this result will not be in, in, will not create enough impact and demand effect to increase the growth and increase the dynamic sector share uh, in the Mercosur in the long run. So there will poss- there will highly possibly there will be pay- uh, faster race to the bottom. Dynamic sectors will shrink, incentives for green technological will cha- change will decline because of the competition and cost-cutting behavior of the, st- uh, the dynamic sector or manufacturing related sectors. And as a result, there will be more wage depression, more inequality and deepening the industrialization in those uh, countries. So they will be a step closer to stagnation. The picture is not, okay, the, the deal is not gonna provide a miracle for the EU as well, of course, but if necessary macroeconomic policies are implemented in some places, some of them may actually gain from that. 
unless, only if they are industrializing, still industrializing. Of course, there will be an increase in manufacturing good production and export and probably increase the productivity in those dynamic sectors, but most of the places in the EU as well, this won't be enough to cause long-term growth, productivity or employment impact. As a result, EU totally will uh, gain competitiveness against Mercosur, but faster race to the bottom still is on the picture. There will be lower intensity for green technological change, both because of the competition between uh, the regions and within the EU itself. As a result, stagnant economy may or may not expand in, based on the countries, how big it is or how industrializing it is. Uh, but if labor market policies are improved and expansion of dynamic sectors occurs, in the end, the income inequality may be lowered. The industrialization, especially the largest part of the EU, will definitely continue, maybe deepening. Um, but stagnation is still a possibility in some parts, especially if they are not, that those trends are not reversed. So today, um, this is all I want to say, and you can visit our website for individual toolkits for, uh, for the countries. So thank you so much again. Thanks so much, both of you, for a uh, clear presentation of the highlights of the paper. The paper itself is uh, in the chat. You can look at it in a variety of different languages. Uh, the, the first of our commenters will be Nelson Barmosa. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. Well, can you hear me well? Okay, so thank you for the invitation to be here, and I congratulate Geraldine and, and Oslin for the very good paper. I think you, you did a great job in summarizing a lot of information in a very objective and intelligible way. Uh, my comments, uh, just to add some uh, local local insights on what your results. When we see the results, what, what, what surprised me is how small the gain is, because I have been reading a lot of, about this in the Brazilian press, and obviously people usually say that GDP will grow by two, three, four percent in two decades. And from what you find, just simulating with the usual computable general equilibrium model is a gain of one percent of GDP which is almost negligible if you take in what you can gain, for instance, in reducing unemployment. If you just reduce unemployment, you're going to have a much higher gain in GDP than from the straight deal. Obviously, you can do both. You can combine both. But just to put the two things in perspective, right now in Latin America, we have a very high unemployment rate and a lot of people in the informal sector. So most of the productivity gains in this kind of dualistic, structurally unbalanced economies uh, actually can come faster through proper uh, development policies that address this structural uh, bottlenecks. On Brazil, because I will, we probably have some people here from Brazil uh, watching this, your table three for me is, is striking because you show that in Brazil we have two industrial sectors. So when you say this is going to benefit industry, we should ask what industry? The agro-industrial sector will boom. According to your calculations, we'll gain almost 2% of, of higher output. But then when you look to the manufacturing, it's, it's going to collapse. It's going to fall close to 1.6% of GDP, especially in machinery, uh, vehicles, and, and electronics. And just to add, in Brazil, the agro-industrial sector is mostly domestic. The, the machinery, auto, and the electronic sector is mostly multinational with a, with a strong presence of European countries. That's why this deal is being supported by the Brazilian industrial sector, because the local multinational is not going to argue against that. And the local, uh, actually, manufacturer will benefit from that. And the other thing that comes out from this table tree is how much the service sector, especially financial services, will benefit. And something that you pointed out, and I think deserves more development, is the deindustrialization by financialization. I think this is what we're seeing in Latin America. We have a financial sector that booms, that collects fees and intermediates capital arbitrage between the high, high interest rate economies, very volatile economies, and the rest of the world. This sector is integrated to, to, to the world economy, usually upper class, in benefits for all these kinds of deals. 
but this will not benefit the rest of the economy. I'm not, I'm not a priori against or in favor of trade deals. It can work if it's done properly, but you want to try to integrate very different uh, economies uh, without uh, paying attention to the structural differences, and especially the impact, as you pointed out, on inequality and employment. And this is something that the CGE models will not tell you because they always assume full employment and distribution is fixed by the coefficients of the production function. So the question is not asked. And, but as we know from, from economic history, if you push this kind of development, it's, it's a negative specialization. Instead of diversifying your economies, you're gonna concentrate on the comparative advantages. It's a kind of, if you will, a new version of the Treaty of Methuen between Portugal and England of the early uh, 18th century, but now in the 21st century. So just gonna increase uh, the specialization but in a region with, we have a high urban population, we're not in the 18th century. There's a high urban population that will flood the service sector, especially informal jobs in the service sector. So the deal is contrict, has a contradiction in itself because as Jeremy pointed out in the beginning, one of the clauses is to promote workers' rights, to avoid social dumping. But the economic effects, whether it's, it's willing or not, uh, they actually will accentuate duality, will accentuate uh, inequality, will push more and more people to urban low paying jobs, which will defeat uh, the purpose of the treaty from a social perspective. Uh, the other thing that I have to comment is, I was more a more technical thing, but I think you have something there that uh, needs and is good to develop. The, the graphs that you do, you compare the dynamic and the stagnant sectors, and you put on the horizontal axis, the, if I'm correct, you put the growth of, of productivity and on the vertical one, the growth of wages. Usually the position of the curves are different. The, 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 the dynamic sectors have a high productivity growth. The stagnant sectors have a low productivity growth. So all the graphs you have different positions, but the slope is not the same. And in most of the European countries, the slope, how much of the productivity gain is passed through salaries is higher in the dynamic sectors than in the stagnant sectors. In Brazil, and I think in Poland, you couldn't do that for Argentina, uh, actually the transmission of productivity gains are faster in the stagnant sector than in the advanced sector. I think that's a puzzle or something to be investigated. My guess that in from Brazil, for the, for the period that you, you analyze that goes through 2014, there were a lot of domestic policies uh, benefiting the, the, let's say, the stagnant sector in terms of minimum wages, uh, 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 more, more labor or labor protection that increased the bargaining power in the domestic service sector. That may explain that. With this, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll have Ramiro Bertoni. And again, uh, if you, there's an interpretation bubble in okay. the bottom right hand corner if you want to listen. Bueno, well, in primer lugar, quiero agradecer al, al, al Global Development Policy Center por su invitación a a, este, a esta jornada y también digamos felicitar a los autores y a todo el centro que digamos se eh, busca incorporar unas miradas heterodoxas en los análisis de, de los tratados de, de libre comercio dado que en general lo que predominan en todas estas miradas son los análisis de equilibrio general que digamos olvidan muchísimo de los impactos de empleo, de productividad, toda la mirada de los sectores estancados o sectores dinámicos que son centrales para el desarrollo y, digamos, y, y, y dinámicas que puedan acortar la brecha de los países en desarrollo. Respecto a las, las bajas ganancias que vemos en, estos, eh, en estas estimaciones, que, que ustedes presentan tres, incluso hay otras estimaciones que dan peor que esto. Hay una estimación que hizo eh, Carlos Bianco, de Argentina, que es ex secretario 
de relaciones económicas internacionales hasta en Argentina hasta el año 2015, y donde se ve que de esos números las consecuencias son peores todavía para los países eh, del Mercosur. ¿sí? Simplemente nombrar, después tal vez le paso el link o le, les comparto la, ese trabajo. También es, eh, me parece que es muy interesante este trabajo, que va más allá de las críticas que muchas veces se hacen incluso desde ciertos sectores de los países del sur eh, a, a este acuerdo, donde la queja muchas veces es que no nos dan más cuotas ¿sí? en el sector agropecuario, que no hay apertura en el sector agropecuario. Y sin embargo, la mayor apertura de, de Europa en el sector agropecuario, si bien podría aumentar nuestras exportaciones, Nada cambia en cuanto al estructural y lo que señala en este, en este trabajo de la desindustrialización prematura, que justamente es un poco lo más, lo, digamos, lo, lo más trascendente para eh, los países de, del Mercosur. Eh, y ahí es, es, también la, es importante la distinción que hacen entre desindustrialización prematura para nuestros países y lo que es la desindustrialización ya de los países desarrollados que pasan un ciclo de, de servicios, etcétera, como plantea Rodri. También en este sentido es interesante cómo si, si el eh, para la Unión Europea en principio hay un gran negocio de entrar productos industriales con una gran preferencia al Mercosur, ¿sí? porque el Mercosur tiene un arancel externo común relativamente alto, más allá que en estos días se está discutiendo, pero el trabajo es muy importante que señale que también esto tiene pies de barro para la misma Unión Europea, porque en la medida que si el Mercosur se empieza a estancar y no tiene ningún dinamismo, las importaciones también van a estar cayendo, con lo cual sale de la, de la visión de que la Unión Europea es el gran ganador y que el Mercosur es el, el único que pierde, sino que esto sería como el, en lugar de lo que dice la teoría de ganar-ganar, esto sería perder, perder. ¿Sí? Me parece que en ese sentido también es, para mí fue llamativo porque de, la, de los análisis nuestros en general de economía política, uno siempre pensaba el gran ganador de la Unión Europea era Alemania y Alemania impulsando, ¿sí? digamos, para vender autos al Mercosur, por decirlo así, frente a que, y Francia que se oponía porque entraban productos agrícolas. Bueno. A veces que esta mirada es bastante más interesante porque está poniendo un, una visión crítica incluso de cómo viene el desarrollo de los últimos años de Alemania y que tal vez serían la República Checa y Polonia aquellos que podrían obtener algunos beneficios más interesantes. Después también me parece que es, es muy importante esta mirada de la selección adversa, ¿sí? de que Mientras Kunde y todas las ideas de desarrollo era ir pasando de los sectores más estancados o tradicionales a los sectores dinámicos, como que acá se daría el sentido justamente inverso y esto terminaría aumentando la brecha ¿sí? de, 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 entre el norte y el sur, ¿sí? porque en, en nuestros países se iría pasando cada vez más hacia los, los peores sectores. Y esto cómo contrasta totalmente con incluso aquellos modelos de comercio, como el de Herscher Olin, que reconocen efectos ganadores y perdedores dentro del comercio, pero que piensan que puede haber compensaciones. Sí, que, que es fácil la compensación. Pero más allá de, de, de esto, en estos modelos de Herscher Olin, aunque no haya compensaciones, la idea es que, es que hay convergencia. Y justamente ustedes están mostrando cómo no, no hay convergencia, sino lo que se profundiza es la divergencia, digamos, en línea con lo que serían las miradas más de, de, de centro-periferia, pero de, no, desde, no analizando ni términos de intercambio, ni la mirada tal vez de intercambio desigual de Manuel, etcétera, sino con una mirada, digamos, más de, más de desarrollo y de las estructuras productivas. También me parece que que es importante que, eh, más allá de que entrarían eh, la desindustrialización de Brasil y de Argentina, como 
como país y al respecto a la Unión Europea, también lo que hace este acuerdo es, es destruir las preferencias que hay entre Argentina y Brasil porque quedan totalmente licuadas, disminuidas. Y para Argentina y Brasil la única posibilidad de desarrollo es poder articular sus sectores industriales. Con lo cual, un acuerdo con la Unión Europea termina de, de romper esta posibilidad que, a, a mi entender, sería una de las pocas posibilidades para que tengamos desarrollo. Después el trabajo en un momento señala que los acuerdos comerciales, cuando hay diferencias estructurales, si no, si no proporcionan instrumentos no convencionales para el cambio tecnológico, la dualidad tiende a agudizarse. ¿Sí? Eso está muy claro, pero a mí me parece que hay algo que es peor, que más allá que el acuerdo Mercosur Europea no provee estos, eh, ele estos elementos necesarios para el cambio tecnológico, sino que encima los reprime o no permite, ¿por qué? Porque hay una pérdida de espacio de política. Más allá de la pérdida de espacio política que ya han tenido los países de desarrollo al formar la OMC en la Ronda Uruguay con toda la, la cantidad de acuerdos, en este caso todavía hay más pérdida por los temas OMC Plus, ¿sí? Desde el tema de avance de servicios, el tema de compras públicas, el tema... De, en este caso, en el acuerdo Unión Europea Mercosur, TRIPS no avanza, ¿sí? Pero sí, aparte de, del tema de, de compras públicas, está el tema de que, por ejemplo, no se va a permitir más retenciones, ¿sí? O regulaciones sobre las exportaciones, o eso se limita muchísimo. Entonces, todo eso también es una fuente de aumentar las asimetrías, porque si bien Europa podría quedar... Este, eh, es tan caro no darle crecimiento a, eh, digamos en América Latina o en Mercosur que necesitamos un cambio estructural esto lo obtura mucho más después por último y para ir eh, cerrando ¿sí? me parece que es central pensar esto también en el mundo post-COVID toda la negociación y la lógica de esta negociación ha sido digamos en el mundo previo más allá de que es una negociación muy larga se cierra en el 2019. Por lo tanto, todos los parámetros de las estimaciones que, que han hecho y que ustedes han, han mostrado de, de, de otros estudios, es en un mundo totalmente distinto al que probablemente vayamos a asistir. ¿sí? Y ahí me interesa nombrar al menos dos cuestiones. Una es que el aumento de la pobreza y de la situación social en nuestros países hace muchísimo más estrecho o más complejo cualquier proceso de reconversión. Digamos, hay mucha menor tolerancia a eh, situaciones de, de desempleo, por más que sean transitorias, como plantea, digamos, la teoría del comercio, que luego se ajustan, digamos, los espacios para cualquier transición de ese tipo son mucho menores por la aguda situación social a la cual, en la cual están nuestros países. Y por otro lado, también para repensar, es todas las tendencias al, al, eh, al reshoring, que ya viene desde algunos años, ¿sí? y también con el COVID tomó más fuerza todo el tema de las cadenas regionales y el near shoring. ¿sí? Y esto entonces también se debería repensar para cómo impactaría en este acuerdo. En algún lado podría atenuar alguna de las consecuencias, porque si las cadenas se regionalizan, tal vez algunas consecuencias, al menos de su industrialización, se atenúan. Pero con el tema del reshoring, tal vez algunas de las ganancias esperadas por inversiones estarían eh, más achicadas, con lo cual podría haber algunas a favor, otras en contra, pero probablemente habría que repensarlo. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Ramiro. And uh, now we'll have Nadia. And for those of you in the in the audience, uh, you could put a introduce yourself and put a question in the Q and A box that you'll see at the bottom here. Uh, and we'll start a conversation soon. Nadia. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for sorry. What what should I do with this Q and A? No, you're fine. I'm sorry. I was talking to. The okay, rest no, of because uh, because a uh, window yep. popped up, so <laughs> suddenly <laughs> it's okay, so I can close it. 
Great. So thank you for, for the invitation and for sharing the paper, which actually is very interesting. There are so many uh, topics and issues which would be worth discussing. Of course, we can't do that uh, today. Maybe we can, I don't know, uh, discuss it again in a few months. Uh, this is currently the stage for, in my opinion, for asking ourselves questions rather than, of course, giving answers. So maybe in a few months we will have some more information as to maybe to start trying to start also giving some some answers. And the main questions that I am asking concerning the potential effects of this uh, trade agreement concerns uh, well whether the extent of the agreement would be such as to change the structure of existing global value chains, or if not to change uh, the structure, at least to put some, some pressure, some further competition between possible uh, alternative links of these chains. So uh, in this sense, I think that including uh, Turkey into this study um, makes a lot of sense because this agreement might actually uh, have effects not only on countries in the European Union, but also, and maybe especially on countries in the geographic periphery of the European Union. So uh, also the consequences on this set of countries should be worth exploring, not only what happens e within the EU. And uh, so this, I think, couples with two, uh, at least two additional aspects, which I think might become uh, uh, relevant in the near future from the point of view of, uh, of Europe. First, uh, we are actually witnessing a kind of an institutional evolution. So uh, a possible change and uh, setting stricter regulations in terms of environmental sustainability, for example. And so this might uh, induce some European uh, OEMs, some European producers to actually move uh, more, the most polluting uh, productions elsewhere. And so elsewhere might, uh, might mean in the immediate geographical periphery of Europe or maybe somewhere else. And so if uh, Mercosur countries become more competitive, uh, I mean, their exports to Europe become more competitive than uh, kind of a competition and race to the bottom for, uh, for workers' rights, for example, might, um, might start. And this would be detrimental for workers in both uh, geographical areas, both uh, in, well, of three geographical areas, Europe, countries of South Europe and uh, Latin America. So this is something which you should, we should wait and, and see. Uh, second, uh, Ramiro already mentioned, and both, both of you already mentioned the uh, automotive sector, especially uh, Nelson when talking about Brazil. Um, there are some European OEMs who already started uh, reconverting their plants uh, to the production of components and modules for electric vehicles uh, and leaving, uh, I mean, and production for uh, traditional, let's say traditional uh, cars are, have been moved to, at the time being, to Poland, Czech Republic, and especially uh, Hungary. So in case, uh, again, Latin American, some Latin American countries were to become more competitive also in this sense, then maybe some kind of relocations could happen also in this sector. So I'm not sure that this agreement would reduce production in the automotive sector in Mercosur countries. Uh, an example is uh, former FCA, uh, which actually, I mean, uh, engines for traditional cars are already produced in Brazil, in Pernambuco, and then imported to Europe. So this might, and many other, I mean, other European OEMs uh, have their, their plans in, especially in Brazil. So I'm not totally sure that this would, would go in the direction of reducing uh, output in those sectors. Of course, anything which, which creates additional dependence on uh, foreign countries might be detrimental for countries in in Latin America. So it is the uh, unfortunately old well-known story of the center and uh, on the periphery. I would like to conclude uh, stressing that in the last, at least in the last two decades in Europe, uh, global value chains restructured in such a way that now we see that we have 
kind of a concert, concentric circle structure. So there are core countries in the very center. Then there are uh, periphery. I mean, there is a, a more external circles and so on. For example, Italy uh, was, I mean, used to be a central country, and I think that now actually became a kind of peripheral country within the EU. So each circle is the periphery of the smaller one, and so there are actually many centers and many uh, peripheries in this in this new structure. Uh, regionalization acts exactly in that direction. So each uh, link of the chain trades with the uh, with a closer circle. And so somehow Mercosur countries and some uh, peripheral European countries or countries in the immediate uh, borders, uh, I mean, immediately outside borders of the EU actually are somehow lying on the same circle. And so competition might become quite fierce between uh, between these countries. And my fear is exactly that this might start, as you were mentioning before, a race to the bottom concerning especially uh, working conditions, salaries, and things like that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia, Nelson, and Romito, and of course, Yedemim and Oslam. So we have a lot of questions here in the question and answer. I'll try to cluster a handful of them and, and hand them to the panelists, and you can uh, whoever feels uh, like it's it's something you want to react to, uh, we'll do as many rounds as we can. We've got uh, close to 20 minutes here. Um, I'll start uh, with one from Rafael Codeco from the Ministry of Economy in Brazil. He wonders, what are the panelists' views about the implications of non-tariff chapters in the EU-Mercosur deal? Many of these modeling efforts are look at uh, just some of the goods trade, but obviously these these deals have subsidies, investment roles, financial services, and so forth. Um, and to what extent do the panelists think that the agreement uh, gives countries the proper policy space to formulate development public policies in a world marked by increasing state economic activism in the face of the post-COVID recovery? Um, we also uh, have one from Leonardo Stanley, a uh, friend of the GDP Center from CEDES in, in Argentina. He says, whereas in, in theory, industrialization has negative consequences on the environment, such as the pollution haven, the agreement pushes Mercosur countries towards both deindustrialization and large environmental losses. Uh, as an example, uh, increasing deforestation in, in Brazil because uh, they have a comparative advantage in, in beef and soy and so forth. Uh, environmental issues should be added into this into these analyses to look beyond the discourse uh, that the EU Mercosur goes goes into. Um, we have one from uh, Goose Gertz, uh, uh, Agriculture Coalition for Just Trade in the Netherlands. Goose asks. Is it possible to work together on a sustainable diversified economy and, and re-regionalization within these rules? Um, that's his question. Let me see if I can put one more in here. Um, oh, uh, interesting question by Paul Dupre. It says, where will the industrialization go? Uh, since uh, while looking at uh, these models, we see, uh, we see increased polarization and, and significant uh, accentuation of the trends of deindustrialization where is it going? Why don't we start with that, with, with those, and um, folks in the audience, please go into the Q&A button, introduce yourself, ask a question, maybe we'll have time for another round or two. Hi, uh, should I start? Okay, uh, with the last question, where will be industrialization going? Yeah, most of the time they're going to financialization and real estate, especially developed countries or offshoring the, the, to, to the outside. Um, this similar pattern also observed in uh, deindustrializing and financializing countries like the like Brazil itself or Turkey in a sense. Um, about the how um, this deal can be like non-tariff deal within the country could be managed pers uh, individually by countries, of course, depends on the local governments how willing they will be supportive uh, for the necessary uh, policy tools, again, is gonna be up to the individual countries' uh, act, active reactions. So we can't really say much about but what needs to be done. They need to, especially in Mercosur, they need to support industrialization, green industrialization, 
and also the protecting the workers law. Otherwise, these observed negative patterns that what we have been seeing for so long now is just gonna get worse and might even cause some secular stagnation in some parts of the world. Uh, about um, uh, the industrialization and environmental losses, uh, a combination of those to study uh, is, would be great. And uh, we will probably keep working on similar issues to bring those too. But as I br we briefly mentioned, uh, they are highly related because how these individual countries, especially in Mercosur, without any policy push within the country or outside with these trade deals are going to reach those green industrialization is even a bigger question because then it becomes how you finance those uh, infrastructures and how you are going to deal with the debt issues, right? Therefore, when we think about the cost cutting behavior, when it comes to open competition with the trade liberalization, it seems to be uh, really hard to reach that, um, that, 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 that point in many countries, including within the EU. So those are the ones that I captured. And I also wanna answer one question, not the question, but the point that uh, Barbosa, Nelson Barbosa did. Uh, exactly, each country has different characteristics within the stagnant, within the dynamic sectors. And, and as he mentioned, what happened in, the, in Brazil uh, was well, the slope of the stagnant sectors were higher, about 1%. Basically saying means that when the productivity was increasing 1%, actually wages were growing a little bit higher in the stagnant sectors. But uh, what, when we look at it, this is the exact cause when uh, between 2000 and 2014 that resulted in declining inequality in, in Brazil. Even though it's still high, it was declining. But after 2014, the trend gets back. Productivity started to slow down again, GDP growth slowed down again, and, and income inequality has started to pick up again, even though it wasn't uh, in our data. So thank you so much. Other thoughts, comments on those on that cluster of questions? Uh, the one from the Ministry yeah. of Finance of uh, Brazil. I'll add, I'll add the compliment with a few a few things. Um, so first of all, on the non-trade, on the non-tariff measures issue and, and policy space, we don't know enough in this case because we, we know about the tariffs and the trade chapter, but the non-tariff um, parts of the proposal aren't uh, as final. And, and so it's, it's unclear also, it's difficult to put these things in quantitative terms. What, what the standard models do is they just assume a tariff equivalent of a non-tariff measure, which is obviously, you know, a, a pretty a pretty uh, arbitrary exercise and, and, and we're not doing that. Uh, but uh, if, you know, recent history is any guidance, I haven't seen any non-tariff measure chapter of, of, um, of trade agreements, um, you know, favor the expansion of policy space. In fact, it, what happens is usually quite the opposite. So, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have to look at this, but this does not, this not, this not figure in an explicit way in, in the studies that, that we look at. So, it, it, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to tell. Uh, it, in terms of what this agreement does for development, uh, you know, in, in, in from for development policy, you know, it creates a bunch of challenges potentially, but it, it doesn't do anything active to to remove the the obstacles and the bottlenecks that that we are worried about, and that the studies that that we started from are entirely overlooking. It, you know, it, in some way, the re relationship here between between trade liberalization and macro policy is, is as it. The way I think about it is, you know that to be in good health, you have to exert yourself, but you know that if you exercise, you need to drink. And if someone's telling you to exercise, but they don't guarantee that you're gonna be able to drink, you're gonna run into a serious problem. And this is a little bit what's happening here. With trade liberalization, the countries are gonna expose themselves to a, a bunch of risks, but they're not, they're not, no one's telling them that they will surely have the tools to, to, uh, to respond to those, to those critical, um, events that might, that might happen. Um, the environment uh, story is absolutely very important. We're not, we're not looking into that uh, in detail, uh, but it, what we know from the data that we've observed is enough to get seriously concerned. The studies that, you know, the, the projection studies, they do a fairly detailed analysis of this stuff, but it's based again on all these assumptions and on, and on a vision of the overall economic picture that is, it is entirely, um, Unrealistic, almost arbitrary, given given the the, the risks that it removes from from the picture. Um, 
and uh, also I wanted to acknowledge uh, what um, Nelson and Nadia and Ramiro said about uh, all the caveats and the regional and the sectoral and subsectoral issues that that um, must be taken into account. It's absolutely all very true. Um, in, in some way, because we're cognizant of that, that's exactly why we, we didn't go into the specific sector level and subsector level projections, because it's it, it requires um, a, a type of analysis that it's really riddled with with issues. But what we know, and that you know, that that's basically our our, our take home point is that because of all the assumptions that are needed to provide results in those areas, then this so-called evidence that we have, it, it's virtually useless. And, and it's, it's worrisome that uh, sometimes it enters the debate in a way that it might really lead to serious policy choice. Any other comments on those questions from the panelists? Uh, on the non-tariff clauses, I think we, after the pandemic, we're seeing the more Many, we're seeing many developed countries uh, explicitly adopt industrial policies and trying to reshore uh, some things and giving incentives to innovation and research and development. So uh, theoretically, the treaty can accommodate that because you 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 can you can sign the, the clause on government procurement, but it still gives you some leeway to use that for innovation and development. But in practice, that tends to restrict the policy space for developing countries. So I think this should be dealt with very carefully, especially now that everybody's doing industrial policy, even with a different name. It's environmental policy, it's health policy, it's something else. But it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's age-old industrial policy with modern objectives. I had a couple of just on this uh, on this issue of non-tariff chapters, of course, as uh, Jeremy said before, uh, we don't know exactly what's inside, but probably the let's say the the, the ideological framework will be the, the same. But it's again talking about, from the point of view of Europe, it's also the same which is prevailing in the European Union without the need to sign any any agreement. Meaning that also the public. Um, let's say industrial policies which are uh, designed, I mean, which different countries are designing now are not exactly what, I mean, they do not uh, imply direct intervention of the public sector in the, in the economic activity. So, which I think would be needed to, I mean, to have real uh, long-term economic policies. So some kind of, uh, some kind of planning would be required and that should be done by the state, in my opinion, and this is not possible. Any, I mean, even without uh, knowing the, the non-tariff chapters of the agreement. So this is unfortunately, I think, the mainstream in, uh, in general. So we have to deal with that in any case. Thank you. We've only got five minutes. I want to let the authors uh, give, a, uh, give, give a last word. Oh, Ramiro, please. Sí. Con respecto a lo que se, se, señala, se señalaba de esto de los capítulos no, no arancelarios, si bien es cierto que es muy difícil eh, poder ponerlos en un modelo, poder hacer eh, cuál es el impacto arancelario y, y, todo, y toda esa, esa metodología para estimar directamente el impacto económico, En, en muchos casos eh, se, puede, se puede deducir cuáles son sus impactos sistémicos, digamos, en cuanto a las capacidades de eh, generar o políticas públicas, o por ejemplo recién Nelson Barbosa hablaba de que eh, probablemente tengamos que hacer políticas industriales, <coughs> tengamos que hacer mayor innovación y eso podría compensar de alguna manera los temas de, de compras públicas, pero... Si, si se firmase el acuerdo, incluso en el acuerdo hay temas sobre la participación, la distorsión de las políticas de empresas estatales o un mayor refuerzo del acuerdo de subvenciones. Entonces me parece que claramente eh, todo lo que es no arancelario tiende fuertemente a, digamos, 
eh, fijar las ventajas comparativas más estáticas y dificultar mucho generar ventajas comparativas dinámicas. E incluso en el caso de Argentina, que del Mercosur es el país que más utiliza regulaciones sobre las exportaciones, ¿sí? por ejemplo, que es algo que le permitió desarrollar la industria del biodiesel y no exportar solo soja y poder exportar biodiesel, la, la imposibilidad o la limitación a las retenciones va a ser una complicación para llevar adelante estas políticas, más allá de que refuerza el impacto regresivo interno, dado que estas políticas sobre exportaciones muchas veces se utilizan con fines redistributivos. ¿Sí? Nada más. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, before I give the, the last word to, to the two report authors, I just want to plug uh, some, some other GDP Center work that, 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 uh, that addresses some of the things that came out. Uh, one of the legal scholars on our team, uh, Rachel Thrasher, is coming out with a forthcoming book uh, called Constraining Development, The Shrinking of Policy Space in the International Trade and Investment Regime. Uh, and as, as Yedanim said, the The full text for a lot of these non-tariff non barrier sections are, are not released yet. Um, however, if they track what the European Union has been, has been doing with other countries in, 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 other, in other trade deals, uh, it would restrict the ability of Mercosur and European Union countries to, to mitigate some of the impacts that are, uh, are shown in the Oslo and uh, Yedanim study. Um, the financialization, uh, many of the policies that, that uh, Minister Barbosa put in place uh, during the financial crisis were to, to try to deal with that speculation uh, in the carry trade. Uh, those would be illegal and actionable uh, under most uh, EU treaties. And a lot of the industrial policies, by definition, if you're favoring a domestic industry over a foreign, that violates the fundamental tenet of, uh, of many of these trade agreements, which is national treatment, even though Uh, countries in the north are starting to do this even even more and more. I think this is one of the functions of a, of a treaty that started with a model in the 90s when the evidence was much different, the thinking about these things were much different, and the set of goals that countries have for their societies are much different. And unfortunately, 20 years later, uh, we're, uh, we're in a much different world than where this negotiation started. Let me let uh, Yedanim Capaldo and, and Aslam have a last word, if there is one, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll move on. Awesome, you want to start? Uh, yeah, well, uh, free trade agreements always create winners and losers. So who is going to take which side will, of course, be seen in the future. But uh, uh, besides that, in individual governments within their own country has to take some more actions just to compensate at least whatever was missing uh, from those trade deals, especially when it comes to uh, workers' rights. So thank you for everyone for joining. Um... Yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree with that. I think um, what, what escapes sometimes in this, in this discussion is what a powerful uh, instrument for development trade can be uh, if properly managed and, and how a dangerous, in fact, uh, instrument can be if it's not properly managed. So, so the, it, it's easy to have a, a one-sided discussion on that. Unfortunately, the one-sided discussion is exactly the one that emerges from, from the, the standard way to, to analyze these things. I, I, I'm assuming that most people that are listening to this uh, are follow international trade issues and, and are aware that we're now starting a discussion about the reform of the WTO. So it, I, I think it, it, it's worth to spend a word in, uh, about this because the, the, the context is the, the moment in which this uh, EU trade project uh, happens is one in which The, the WTO uh, it needs to be reformed and there's a strong feeling that it needs to be reformed uh, because it doesn't deliver on, on the expectations that uh, developing countries have uh, on, on trade on the, from the international trading system. And what part of, the, part of the, the main expectation here is that trade can be uh, used and complemented with the policies that allow trade to work for development. By contrast, The EU, trade, the EU Mercosur agreement in its, in, it, in its current text and based on what the studies that it, even its proponents are, are putting forward is not really doing that. So, so there is a there's, a, there's also a, a bit of a historical disconnect there that as Ramiro pointed out has to do with the COVID 
uh, phase that that are the global economy is leaving and its own vulnerabilities and the longer term vulnerabilities that have been that have emerged from the the, the flaws of the international trading system. Thank you. Well, folks, we, we had uh, over 150 people right here in the webinar room with us, and we we're also live, live streaming this uh, at the same time. Uh, you can tell your friends that it's also uh, now will be on the GDP Center YouTube page if folks didn't have a chance to, uh, to take a look at it or you want to go back and look at something else. So obviously, there's a lot of interest in this topic and a lot of interest in this paper. I congratulate uh, both of you for the work that you did on it and really want to thank uh, our panelists for commenting on it. Uh, and let's hope this isn't the, the end of the conversation and that this is the beginning. Um, as, we, as we know, a lot of the text has been agreed to, but there hasn't been a uh, there haven't been signatures and uh, very far away from ratification. I think I, I want to underscore something that Yeti said. I think uh, here at the GDP Center, we think that uh, what we, one of the major goals of the, of the world economy uh, over the next two decades is a massive mobilization of resources for structural transformation across the world economy that makes the world economy more socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. Uh, that's going to take uh, and that in, in increased investment, foreign investment and domestic investment and in increased trade uh, are going to be fundamental to that effort. And we need to make sure that these treaties are aligned with those goals uh, and don't hinder the ability of the nations to be able to meet those goals, especially in the post COVID era. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Please visit our webpage, uh, www.bu.edu slash GDP uh, or uh, take a look at, uh, follow us on Twitter uh, to find out about more studies like this into the future.